If all your blood vessels were laid end to end, how long would they be? What's your immediate reaction to this question? Are you a crazy trivia junkie who knows the answer? Do you take a wild guess? Look it up in a book? Ask a friend? Contact an expert? Nope, I'm guessing you reach for your smartphone and begin Googling it. So it's been confirmed by Dr. Sparrow and colleagues that people immediately start to think about computers when given a difficult trivia question to answer. Probably not too much of a surprise, but what's really interesting from Dr. Sparrow's research is that people are less likely to remember the answer to that question if they expect that the computer will allow them to access it again in the future. Instead of trying to remember the answer itself, they instead remember where they located it. In other words, we are becoming pretty comfortable with relying on computers to store our information for us. The computer seems to be quickly replacing the books, lists, family, friends, etc. we traditionally used as our transactive memory system. Now this evolving tendency to outsource information to the computer, more specifically the internet, has some of our researchers in a bit of a flap. Technology author Nicholas Carr argues that relying on Google to help us make shortcuts and store knowledge will never lead to deep understanding. The high cognitive load caused by the vast stores of information, the navigational choices, and the rapid onslaught of sensory stimuli we face when using the internet are inhibiting our ability to move information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. Think of your short-term memory as a note-taker, your working memory as a filer, and your long-term memory as the filing system. If your filer is too overwhelmed that he can't keep up with the note-taker, then the incoming notes may not be properly processed and filed into long-term memory. Creative thought, new schema, and Oprah-like aha moments are believed to occur when your brain is able to mull over the information it has filed in its long-term memory. If we replace our long-term memory with Google, we risk becoming what Richard Foreman called pancake people, spread wide and thin. While we may know a little about a lot of things, we'll know a lot about nothing. But our shopping lists and even spouses, you know, where the wife remembers the anniversary and the husband remembers the account balances and bills, that different from the internet? According to Clev Thompson, we've been using transactive memory for millennia with other humans. In everyday life, we're constantly drawing on what other people know. This has allowed society to progress, to achieve things greater than what could have been achieved by the individual. We're simply seeing our transactive habits adapt to the new technology. So what makes the internet so appealing as a transactive memory? While it's always accessible, up-to-date, rapid, far-reaching and ever-expanding, immediately responsive to user input, fairly organized, it also gives you choice not only in how complex you want the information you are seeking to be, say Google versus Google Scholar, but also in how you want the information to be formatted and stored. Thompson doubts that we are harming our creativity by outsourcing pieces of knowledge. In fact, he suggests that offloading some of our memory might actually be liberating. By reducing the cognitive load on our brains, we can have greater capacity available for tasks that require a more human touch. And while we may readily outsource dull details like addresses and phone numbers, we don't turn off our memory to knowledge we're interested in. Yes, in an ideal world, we'd be curious about everything and sponging up all the information around us. But disinterest in certain areas of curriculum, for example, it's an age-old problem that's existed in education long before curriculum. But in contrast to former transactive memories, Thompson warns that the internet differs in its transparency. Typically when we outsource memory, we already have some knowledge of the person or machine's strengths, weaknesses, and biases. Going back to the husband and wife example, the wife knows that while the husband is good at keeping the books balanced, she also knows that he quietly stashes a bit of cash away to save up for sales at Home Depot. It might be easy to assess the reliability of a person, but it's not so easy to assess, for example, a search engine where its mechanisms are intentionally kept secret to ensure perpetual competitiveness in a fast-paced market. Such search engines claim to be neutral keepers of information, but are they in fact impartial and unbiased? As self-publishing continues to increase, we must learn how to scrutinize online information. Thompson argues that this is a skill that should be taught with the same urgency we devote to teaching writing and math. The intent of this animation is not to scare you off Google, nor is it to give you a permission to give up on studying. Rather, it is to make internet users more cognizant of how we use this resource and its potential effects, good, bad, and neutral, on us. Harvard research suggests that search engines like Google give people the sense that the internet has become a part of their own cognitive tool set. People feel smarter when they're able to use Google to answer questions and have a natural tendency to take credit for remembering and knowing the things that they actually used Google to find. Wenger and Ward anticipate that advances in technologies may continue to blur the lines between mind and machine but don't see this as a threat to our identities. Rather, we are simply forming a more powerful transactive memory system that may surpass the current limits on memory and thought.